morning. Welcome to worship on this May bank holiday weekend. I hope you've had a good week. It's good to be sharing with you again, and we continue to be thankful for the blessing of technology, which allows us to worship together, even though we are physically apart. The Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's begin our worship today by singing a song of praise, a song of worship as we confirm the lordship of Jesus in our lives. The song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. And the chorus says, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Let's sing together before we come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, once more we come to you in worship. We thank you for the week that has passed, for all that has been asked of us and for all that has been gifted to us. We want to praise you, to express our love to you and to thank you for Jesus, whose life, death and resurrection has provided the pattern and the power for holy living. We come together in his name, and pray that as a result of our worship today, 
our lives will be enriched for the kingdom's sake. We enclose within our circle of prayer those whose lives touch our own, family members, friends, neighbours, colleagues. We remember especially those for whom life is such a burden at the moment. Let us be as Christ in the world to them. May our offering of worship be acceptable to you today and may your name be glorified. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but it seems all too often I tend to miss the start of a TV programme I wanted to watch. Maybe I haven't got home in time or the telephone is wrong or I've been on the computer and forgotten the time. Often, it's because the adverts have come on and I've changed the channel and got into something else and forgot to turn back over again. The problem is, if you miss the beginning of a programme, it's sometimes hard to understand what's going on because so often it's the introductory scenes that set up the plot for the rest of the programme. So if you miss those crucial scenes, you struggle to make sense of the rest of the programme. And I would suggest that's even more important when you are studying a book of the Bible. It's important to pay close attention to beginnings and endings, because often in those places, crucial themes and strands of the plot are laid out, which are developed elsewhere in the book. Our scripture reading today is some very familiar verses from the beginning of the book of Colossians. And we see the writer doing a similar thing in this first chapter, the scene being set. In the verses we will read, we encounter what has been called the Colossian hymn. And it's referred to as a hymn, not in the sense of something to be sung but more a densely packed set of theological statements, full of incredible affirmations about the person of Christ. Let me give you a bit of background. The book of Colossians was probably written at the same time as those of Philemon and Ephesians. Colossae was, at the time of writing, an unimportant town with a mixed population, a pluralistic society, including Greeks, Romans, Jews and Christians, along with much astrology and superstition. The church at Colossae had been planted some time ago, but wrong teaching was now affecting the church. Something called syncretism was the issue, which was a, a mixing of Christianity with other ideas. And it meant that the message and person of Jesus Christ was no longer preeminent. So this letter to the church at Colossae was written by the Apostle Paul to address that issue. Listen as the scripture is read to us from the beginning of Colossians. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn son to all created things. For through him, God created everything in heaven and on earth. The seen and the unseen things included spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things and in union with him, all things have their proper place. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. For it was by God's own decision that the son had himself the full nature of God. Through the son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to him. God made peace through his son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all the things, both on earth and in heaven. So before we look at those verses in more detail, let's sing again. Song 87 follows on nicely from that scripture reading. The first verse says, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Son of God, son of man, lamb that was slain. Joy and peace, strength and hope, grace that blows all fears away. Jesus, what a beautiful name. Let's sing together. Oh 
scripture reading declared that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. That's a great turn of phrase, isn't it? Christ is the image of the invisible. In other words, he makes visible the invisible, not like a picture for a two-dimensional image can't quite capture the reality. Nor is it like a three-dimensional image, such as a waxwork from Madame Tussauds. No matter how accurate or lifelike they may be, such images fall short of what Colossians has in mind. Verse 19 gave us a clearer indication. It said, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's quite an emphatic phrase, all his fullness. To say the fullness of God would have been sufficient. To say all the fullness of God is to emphasise that all God is, Whatever that might include is to be found in Jesus Christ. Christ makes visible the invisible. It's a profound statement of incarnation, our fundamental Christian belief that God became human in Christ Jesus and in so doing became what we are in order to make us what he is. And Colossians goes on to describe Christ as the firstborn of all creation. Now that's not to suggest that Jesus himself is created, but rather that all things are created in him, through him and for him. Again, an emphatic description, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And in him, all things hold together. And if that's true, it means that without him, everything falls apart. Now, I don't know about you, but I've certainly found that to be true in my own life, and I'm sure you have too. But then the punchline comes in verse 20. Through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. There's that picture of redemption on an epic cosmic scale. The Colossian Christians, it would seem, were perhaps in danger of making their God too small, in danger of thinking of redemption in personal rather than cosmic terms, in danger of overestimating their own role in redemption and underestimating the abundance of God's grace which reaches to all creation. By pointing them to the supremacy of Christ and reminding them that it's through the blood of that same Christ that God is pleased to reconcile all things to himself. The letter to the Colossians lifts their gaze and ours and invites us to focus on the one who is all in all. This is a reminder we would do well to heed. We too are often guilty of making our God too small. Guilty of thinking of redemption in personal rather than cosmic terms. Guilty of thinking and speaking of mission in terms of human response rather than the abundant generosity of divine grace. And the Apostle Paul here is not content simply to remind them and us of the supremacy of Christ. What he really wants to go on to point out to is the implications of the death and resurrection of this supreme Christ. You who were once estranged and hostile in mind, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. The point of our salvation is reconciliation and sanctification. Put another way, the destination, the end point of salvation in Christ is not that we believe the right things, 
Not even so much that we do the right things, but rather that we become the right thing. People reconciled with God and presented as holy, blameless, irreproachable. The good news of the gospel is that whoever or whatever we have been in the past sets no limit on who and what we can become in the future. For in Christ and through Christ, we can be transformed, reconciled, presented as holy and blameless, whatever our past or our present may be. I heard a politician being interviewed the other week. He was asked about his faith and he said, I sometimes pray. I'm like regular Church of England folk. It's part of my life and my identity. But I don't think it defines my politics. What a statement. Surely if you are a Christian, if you profess to have a regular prayer life and a relationship with God, then that has to define everything else about you. God is not remote from our world, our choices, our values, or even our politics. Rather, we serve God by the choices we make in the everyday. You know, in a year where we have seen so many strange and scary things happening, at a time when we are told to prepare for difficult financial times as we look to recover economically from the COVID pandemic, we desperately need a reconnection between our politics and our faith in the everyday. We have elections coming this week. Please include our government, our politicians and our country in your prayers. So what might it mean to love Christ in the everyday with all your heart, soul and strength and mind? Christ who is the image of the invisible God in whom all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, in whom all things hold together, meaning that without him everything falls apart. What does it mean to love that Christ? Is that the Christ we worship both through our acts of service and our times of devotion? Is our God too small? Too small for the complexities of our world and our politics. Too small for the challenges facing the local churches. Too small for the problems facing our communities. Do we keep God in a nice contained and safe space called Sunday worship? If that's where you find yourself today, may these words of Colossians speak to you afresh and remind you of the supremacy of the one in whom we find salvation, in whom all things hold together, and who calls us to love in the everyday, our Lord Jesus Christ. We sing a final song together, 374 in your songbook. It says, Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it. For by his power, each tree and flower was planned and made. Jesus is Lord. The universe declares it. Sun, moon and stars in heaven cry, Jesus is Lord. Let's sing together. Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims.
mighty conqueror from death he rose and all his foes shed on his name Jesus is Lord God sent his Holy Spirit to show my words of power that Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord final benediction. This is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. It's Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for all that is past and trust him for all that's to come. Amen. We will run.